Welcome. I'm Cindy Peterson, Executive Director with the Taubman Museum of Art, and I'm honored to have you join our virtual tour for the exhibition, A Very Anxious Feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience, 20 Years of the Beth Rudin DeWoody Collection. Organized by the Taubman Museum of Art, this exhibition shines light on the widespread feelings of anxiety in contemporary art. Referencing both collective and personal anxieties, the works in this exhibition highlight intersectional voices sharing their dissent, joy, and transcendence. The exhibition amplifies the voices and experiences of Latinx and Latin American artists living and working in the United States, with all works acquired by Beth Rudin DeWoody over the past 20 years. We are honored to share this very special exhibition with you. Our mission at the Taubman is to bring people and art together for discovery, learning, and enjoyment, and always meeting the community where they are. A Very Anxious Feeling provides a remarkable opportunity to do just that. We are deeply grateful to Beth for sharing her collection and to those whose support have made this exhibition possible. Our presenting sponsors, Dorothea L. Leonhardt Foundation, Inc., the Dorothea Leonhardt Fund at the Communities Foundation of Texas, Inc., and Joanne Leonhardt Casulo. Additional sponsorship support is provided by the Roanoke Arts Commission of the City of Roanoke and Blue Ridge Beverage. We are also grateful to you, our friends tuning in today. Enjoy the tour. So this is a work by a duo named Assume Vivid Astrofocus, and they created this work called A Very Anxious Feeling in 2007. We thought it was so perfect for this particular moment that we actually decided that it would be a great title for this entire exhibition. Anxiety is something that, um, that everyone feels. And so while this work was made about 13 years ago, it feels maybe more relevant now than ever before. One of the things that I loved that they wrote about this work, they said it, in, neon signs instigate a holy presence, selling dreams. It contributes to this effect, this idea of hypnosis, rapture, magic, worship, and prophecy. You look at this work and you see that there is something very deep inside all of us that we can relate to. It's both extremely personal and, and speaking to a very collective feeling of anxiety in this present moment. This is a work by an artist named Farley Aguilar, and the title is called Patriarchy. And if you look at it, it's pretty unsettling. There are five figures all looking out directly at the viewer. They are monstrous. Some of them have their eyes crossed out. Some of them um, are off kilter. They're all wearing um, these old-timey clothes. There's a man with a large jacket and wearing vests and ties. They are all looking out at you from a very stately position. There's a fire whirring in the, in the back, there's a window in the back corner, and the title of the work, Patriarchy, really brings us back to this feeling of those are the people who are in power. Farley Aguilar looks back at old photographs for his inspiration. So he, he mines historical images and brings them into the present day with these bright colors and jagged lines. There is this feeling, this very deep feeling of anxiety looking at this work, looking back at you. And the artist talks about how looking back at our past and revisiting it is an important way to, to think about the future, to really see, to make changes, to recognize the inequities within our society today that have been perpetuated for decades. These look like mobsters from the past or a 19th century gentleman's club. These are scary figures. And maybe they weren't always considered scary, but through the lens that Farley Aguilar has created, we can see a different side to this. He is making visible what history has often made invisible. This salon wall explores artworks of discomfort and protest addressing issues like class, colonization, materialism, and labor. Smaller in scale, some of these artworks are studies and sketches, but inform the exhibition as succinctly as any of the larger works. 
The proximity of the viewer to this intimate grouping both allows the works to be closely examined and creates a larger conversation as part of a unit. Sebastian Arazariz's hand-painted 3D printed sculpture, The Useless Cast, presents an anxiety-filled, not-so-distant future when some predict that the advances in technology will displace the livelihoods of half of the world's population. Humans unable to acquire new skills before those jobs are also lost to machines will be incapable of providing for their own basic needs and will lose their identities and connections to society. Will they riot and try to rise up against the population? Will they choose the new fascist government? We do not know, but we do know there will be huge problems and huge levels of suffering, the artist explains. Using technology as a medium to consider the repercussions of exponential growth of technology, Erasuris scanned and modeled 30 historical sculptures and combine them into a single tableau to concentrate centuries of pain, suffering, and strife into an image of this possible future dystopian world. This is Rafa Esparza's Ojo from 2011. Rafa Esparza began dismantling and reconstructing Nike Cortez high top trainers into hybrid creatures bearing the familiar swoosh logo. Ojo, part of this ongoing series of love bird sculptures, means eye in Spanish, although colloquially ojo or poner ojo is often used as a way to say pay attention or be careful. The artist first began creating these birds from used shoes that he collected from strangers or people in his community thinking about how footwear is marked by both time and the spaces people move through and how shoes hanging over a street power cable are also markers of place or the history and culture of a particular site. By shredding and restitching Cortez trainers in particular, the artist critiques a long history of colonialism and genocide in the Americas, including the destruction of the Aztec Empire by Spanish conquistadores, led by Hernán Cortez. In the upper left, you'll see Tanya Bruguera's study for poetic justice. Performance artist and activist Tanya Bruguera believes in art as a tool for action and systemic change. A study for her installation, Poetic Justice, at the 8th International Istanbul Biennale, the work addressed how the British Empire exported tea leaves grown in colonial India, then processed, rebranded, and sold the tea back to India as a product of British sophistication and class. Bruguera observes, as happened in India with tea, our realities are more and more co-opted, repacked, and sent back to us with pre-digested meaning. They are defined by the media. Like the British Empire before, now corporations control the news and therefore history. I'd like to focus on some works by Carlos Almaraz. In 1971, Carlos Almaraz suffered a near-death experience due to pancreatitis, and only six months after his recovery, his brother died. In his despair, Almaraz stopped painting for a time, yet filled sketchbooks with drawings frequently paired with poems as seen here in San Berdu and in Untitled, a drawing of pairs of cars, which were likely a precursor to his signature car crash paintings. Created during the same period, La Mesa depicts several figures sleeping under the marquee La Mesa Motel, cushioned by pillows and surrounded by cherubs. Only one figure is awake with a fearful expression, taunted by jester-like faces, possibly a nod to the hallucinations he experienced while ill and the demons he faced in the wake of his brother's death. On March 4th, 1989, the year Almaraz died of AIDS complications, the artist famously wrote in his sketchbook, art is a record, a document, that you leave behind showing what you saw and felt you were alive, that's all. Above these sketches is an oil painting by Carlos Almaraz called Pink Overpass from 1984. Almaraz says, I can't just paint pretty pictures because I have fears everyone else does. And sometimes I have to make a picture of these fears. Somehow it's less frightening when you see it there in front of you than it is inside your head and inside your heart. 
Pink Overpass does not depict a car crash or a scene of a tragic blaze that Almaraz is best known for, but the impending drama is implicit. The oversaturated pink sky, the purple freeway lanes, even the street lamps and headlights are all rendered in thick, aggressive impasto. Two vehicles in the lower lane are perched in tight proximity, the brush strokes behind the red car wavering in an indication of reckless motion. The scene unfolds under a late sunset that is rapidly approaching twilight, infusing the painting with a sense of apprehension. The works of Ramiro Gomez have a large part in this exhibition. The need to awaken and make visible what is hidden or overlooked is at the forefront of work by Ramiro Gomez, who illustrates the domestic labor done in the U.S. by Latinx workers. Using the torn pages of luxury catalogs that display clean rooms and perfectly manicured landscapes, Gomez reinserts the people who make these scenes possible. In Clutter Causes Anxiety, a Latinx worker works to remove a vase of flowers on a mid-century modern style credenza. Her features are obscured, we cannot see her face. The blurred features of Gomez's figures echo their blurred status visible but invisible in a setting that both needs and denies their existence and role in American society and domestic life. Multimedia artist Alejandro Cesarco is interested in the intersection of language, imagery, and how we make meaning from looking. Cesarco's text-based conceptual works are both colorful and require the act of reading. The contents of the text are contradictory to the initial visual impression. When I am happy, I won't have to make these anymore, is a melancholy declaration of Cesarco's relationship with his artistic process, masked with bright, energetic colors. Part of a larger series of works featuring the same phrase in a shifting palette of bright hues, Cesarco calls this ongoing project, quote, a stubborn belief that someday things will change and happiness will occur. Best known for his hyper-realistic landscape paintings of Los Angeles, Sayer Gomez reveals the unflattering parts of the city. Cell phone towers unconvincingly covered in palm fronds, chain-link fences, and forgotten billboards with shreds of paper. Gomez's visions of LA capture a city stuck in indefinite time and reveal deep urban alienation. In this trompe painting of a Carrara marble slab, carved with the words, everything must go. The artist has made a common slogan used for temporary but urgent sales into a permanent fixture, maybe a critique of the permanent urgency to consume. The carved Carrara marble might recall ancient Greek or Roman civilizations, the tenets on which the US democracy is based. The carved words could be seen as a call to action an indication that the old traditions, artifacts, and systems that have governed the past cannot lead us forward. Everything must go. During his 1990 performance, Hope is the Last Thing That We're Losing, a protest against Cuban government censorship, Angel Delgado defecated on the communist newspaper Granma and was subsequently imprisoned. Over the course of his six-month sentence, Delgado learned new art-making techniques using everyday materials from his fellow inmates and began employing them in his own practice. Since his confinement in Cuba and subsequent life in exile in both Mexico and the United States, Delgado has continued to mine the imagery of imprisonment and materials used by prisoners, suggesting that the restrictions and limitations of prison extend beyond its walls. Carved from bars of soap, these 20 small houses are meditations on freedom and how it can be restrained, controlled, or taken away. I'm going to talk about this moment. Um, Daniel Martinez, who's a Los Angeles-based artist, uh, a Latino artist uh, who deals a lot with socio-political subjects and the infection that goes wrong with it. Uh, the piece in front of me here, again, Stupidity, is one of his signage works. He does, works a lot with signage. and. He's always poking and prodding at uh, the canon, poking and prodding at the ramifications of socio-political um, tropes. Especially, um, 
he looks at himself as, as the uh, penultimate outsider. So for his show at the Whitney Museum in 1993, he made all these little badges that everyone got going into the museum and said, I can't imagine ever wanting to be white. So, and which caused a great, it was an incredible piece to be given. And then to see the larger uh, little piece, big pieces of the larger ones that were given when the entrance inside the museum was incredible. In 2007, he was invited back to the Whitney to make a piece, uh, 125 panels of work that dealt with artists that using um, violence as a way to progress political action. So um, he, he's always working in this kind of vein and he works as a multi multitude artist working in painting, painting photography, sculpture, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna spend a moment talking about um, Los Angeles-based painter Ramiro Gomez. Uh, he's got a very interesting story. Ramiro immigrated as a small child from Meshup was Mexico, Central America with his parents. So he's a DACA baby and of course felt very concerned during this whole period. Um, he grew up in, outside of LA in the Inland Empire out by Riverside, San Bernardino. He, as, as an artist, he likes to showcase what we don't see or what we, or what we find invisible. So right here he's showing off the, the preparator as the artist, the person who prepares the gallery for the actual art to go into or, as, or him being the artist. So the invisible, I don't, the landscaper, the housekeeper, the nanny, he was actually a nanny in West Hall. So he's always uh, um, painting all these images of the, what I could call the invisible. So he's also exalting going to LA, went to art school and came out of it. Um, what it's like to live his best trans life. So he's really exalting his pansexuality and he's taking this photographic survey he's doing with his work also. So just a couple minutes about him because I think he's a very interesting artist. This um, work right here is by Margarita Cabrera and it's called Vacuum Cleaner. And as you can tell, it's, um, it's made out of this soft vinyl material. Margarita Cabrera is really interested in sort of breaking down how we get the commodities that we get and where they come from and the labor that they come from as well. So Margarita Cabrera is based in El Paso and spends a lot of time thinking about the trade that happens between Juarez and El Paso, two sister cities on opposite sides of the border. And um, at the time that she was making this in um, the early 2000s, there, was, there were so many women who were being murdered in Juarez who were working at these factories. So, so many of her works actually have a very um, human bodily quality. There is a vulnerability of, of these works. There's sort of a sagging nature that, um, that is pretty inherent to all of these works. And that's intentional. There, that vulnerability is intentional. You can see that you, all of the um, seams are visible. All of the threads are coming out. And that's also intentional. It's to show that this was working Work that was made by hand, that there were people behind it that made this possible. She makes these works by actually taking apart individual commodities and re-piecing them together with this soft material. Um, there's also sort of a level of humor that allows you to engage this work in a way that maybe you couldn't. There's, there's a lot of really deep and hard themes, but by looking at it, you're, you're immediately thinking, oh, I know what that is, but something is a little bit off about it, so it draws you in, it makes you think, it makes you smile, um, and that, that is where um, I think so much of the beauty of this work is. This is King's Road by Ramiro Gomez, and as you can see, there are three or four main figures who are looking out at us. Um, the woman who is pushing the baby stroller, the boy, and the two men in, in the background. And the work of Ramiro Gomez is really about making visible what has been invisible for so long. In this case, the workers, um, domestic workers and lawn workers um, in California who um, are Latinx. In this work, there's actually also another figure. It's these um, hedges that kind of cut through, in this case, one third of the entire painting. And then if you look around, um, there's other hedges surrounding all of these beautiful California houses. And the same people who are taking care of children and manicuring lawns and keeping these hedges intact are actually kept out by these very hedges. 
the artist uses cardboard. So um, for, the, for the woman here and one of the men in the back, he's actually painted on cardboard and placed it on the canvas. And they, um, he's using cardboard for a, a number of reasons, but mostly because he's using cardboard as a metaphor. Cardboard is easy to attain and it's disposable, and that is how he sees um, Latinx workers treated. And for him, it's really important to not only make them visible, but also um, give them a place of presence, particularly um, in these big, beautiful paintings where Latinx workers are not traditionally featured. He's blurred out all of their features, so when you look at this these people, um, this woman in front, it could be um, someone you know, it could be your best friend, it could be your mother. Um, these are people that are, are working hard every day and often working in the shadows without any recognition for the work that they do. A lot of the work that Ramiro Gomez does is also very activist, so he uses cardboard and cardboard cutouts and paints figures working and then places them um, guerrilla style in um, the front yards or lawns in Los Angeles. And people, when they drive by them or walk by them, he says that people notice them more than they actually notice the actual people who are working. And that's intentional. He wants to bring about awareness. He wants to bring, bring about change and make people take note of who is making these homes beautiful, who is taking care of children, who is cooking food um, in order to help build a more equitable future. This is Elmer Guevara's Poker Face, created in 2020. Fascinated with the cityscape at a young age, Elmer Guevara, who grew up in South Central Los Angeles, began his art practice as a graffiti writer. His interest in graffiti soon morphed from teen amusement into a vehicle by which to communicate views on the social issues present around him. Guevara was keenly aware of what he calls the disregarded and overlooked ghost population of homeless people in the community, and a significant body of his work includes visual interviews with those willing to share their stories. Works like the self-portrait Poker Face are autobiographical in nature or are inspired by photos from his parents' life in El Salvador and immigration to the U.S. The title of the work describes the adult-like role the artist often took on as his parents' translator, making important decisions and deals for the family, all concealed behind his poker face. While clearly recognizable as a bicycle, Margarita Cabrera's Bicicleta Blanca, white, made of soft vinyl, takes viewers off guard and invites the curious to come closer, to examine, to reflect. The humor of Cabrera's work lies in the implausibility of what viewers see versus what they know to be true about that object. From this place of curiosity, Cabrera's sculptures invite larger conversations about consumerism, labor, particularly women's labor, and migration. Both the migration of people within and outside of Mexico moving for work and opportunity, and the migration of the commodities that cross between the factories in Juarez and El Paso before eventually landing in stores around the world. Cabrera's Bicicleta Blanca is simultaneously a facsimile of a commodity produced in Mexico and a vehicle for migration. Yet its inability to function in the real world suggests that the system is failing. Guerra de la Paz, literally translated to War of Peace, is the creative collective team of Elaine Guerra and Naraldo de la Paz. Since 1996, they have utilized cast-off clothing to produce multi-layered works creating powerful social and environmental statements about consumption, oppression, and the human impact on our planet. In Martyr, a figure made completely out of discarded camouflage clothing hangs, arms outstretched in the crucifix position. The empty clothing and religious iconography raise questions about combat, suffering, and duty, and ask the viewer to consider not only the cost of war in human lives, but also the connection between the textile industry and the military, and the enormous impact both have on human life. Jacqueline Ame Rosemary Cal Makin 
was a seven-year-old child from Guatemala who died in a U.S. Customs and Border Patrol detention center in 2019. Sandy Rodriguez renders the little girl poignantly in hand-processed walnut ink on a mate bark paper, adorning her with a bright green quetzal, a sacred bird in both Maya and Aztec cultures and the national bird of Guatemala. In 2020, this portrait debuted alongside those of seven other children who died in ICE custody in 2018 and 19. Her solo exhibition, You Will Not Be Forgotten, included maps of U.S. detention centers along the border to reveal where these deaths are taking place. Rodriguez says, if there is a function for art, it is to prompt conversation and action. If you can do it while seducing people with material and beauty, then I think you have a better chance of motivating people. Esteban Ocampo Geraldo paints scenes that are both autobiographical and familiar, capturing moments from everyday life. He is not interested in documenting a memory photographically, but rather capturing the feeling of the experience. He says, most of my paintings are recollections of stuff that has happened in my life, particular moments mixed with the greater feeling of the whole experience that I'm translating into paint on canvas. Indirecto in El Aria is not just a single experience from the artist's childhood playing soccer in Colombia, but rather an amalgam of many such moments. The flattened, stylized depictions of the bodies and faces are pieced together as they would be in a memory or a dream not quite physically accurate, but capturing the experience of a crowded goal box during a tense moment with whimsical precision. Known for her humor and seemingly disparate references to various cultures and styles, the work of Magdalena Suarez Frimkis combines visual elements of pre-Columbian art, Japanese prints, cartoons and pop iconography to deconstruct elements of colonialism and globalization. One of those New York people alludes to a dismissive or disparaging comment used to describe androgynous people, like the figure with the mohawk, frilly collar, and mismatched shoes. Madame Aura Fortune Teller's booth bears upside down writing and lotteria cards, a popular Mexican children's game, in place of tarot symbols signaling cultural misappropriation. Pre-stamp Hispanic Mexican further punctuates cultural tourism, depicting a ragged-edged bowl, a mislabeled and pre-stamped souvenir to satisfy a tourist's desire to collect something viewed as exotic. This section of the exhibition focuses on violence, both personal and societal, and vulnerability and discomfort. Eddie Rodolfo Aparicio's sculpture, Huelemos Como Tu, we Smell Like You, is a response to both historic and present-day injustices perpetuated against Latinx people and the environment. Aparicio explains, there is no neutral position. Environmental justice is inextricably linked to social justice and all materials in art making, especially our bodies, are part of that conversation. His hanging sculptures encapsulate the physical, emotional, and psychic marks that are both experienced and inherited through generations of injustice, injustice against humans and the planet. Using found clothing, symbols of what is left behind during migration, Aparicio soaks the fabrics in rubber and pine sap and molds them around the marked and scarred tree trunks of Los Angeles, home to the largest Salvadoran diaspora. Both the trees and the clothing carry the marks of memories of lived experience, the visible scars on the trees imprinted into the soft textiles of human clothing. The bright colors in Luis Cruz Azacita's The Strip Tease of Humanity belies the violent imagery and deeply allegorical meanings contained within. Rendered in his signature apocalyptic pop style, the figure in the foreground is decapitated its torso completely cut off from the body. Deep slashes leave gaping holes in what remains. The artist, who left Cuba in 1960 for New York City, 
pulls from his own experiences of living through a revolution, of making a new life in a foreign country, and the physical and psychological violence of living in New York City, all to explore the human condition in times of crisis. Albert Perez's Anyone Worth Shooting Once is Worth Shooting Twice, God Damn It, employs perverse humor to challenge Eastern and Western religious and political philosophies critiquing the, quote, abusive marriage of theology and politics. The work is a play on both the literal murder of God's son, Jesus, at the hands of the Romans, and God's symbolic murder through the continuous distortion and manipulation of theological values. The artist explains, it's the idea that one can sometimes follow the faith of an ideology so closely that ultimately the ethos becomes more important than the telos. A full-time mechanic by trade, Perez visualizes the play of systems, which makes its way into his painting. For him, acquiring the right parts takes more time than the actual labor of creating the artwork. He says, my process is more of a furtive case of rhizomatic thoughts that are then birthed through image. This is the 2017 piece, Booed Off the Stage by Coria Scotto. Coria Scotto's Booed Off the Stage uses Hollywood cliches and action sequences to examine our culture of fear. The artist hand cuts stencils to slowly expose analog instant film, like the kind used in Polaroid cameras in a technique that allows Escoto to manipulate the finished product, a process he compares to, and I quote, subverting the perceived reliability as a truthful medium. Boot off the stage taps into an uncomfortable time when social media has an ever-growing streak of mob mentality, a time in which truth is constantly under debate and anxiety runs deep. Art critic Kate McQuaid wrote of Escoto's work, in these days of alternative facts, we question the reliability of the narratives we're fed. Escoto's most recent work is about politics, not art. Javier Pignon's collage is a riff on the iconic image of the early Christian martyr tied to the tree, his body pierced with arrows. In Pignon's version of Saint Sebastian, a young cowboy looks out at the viewer, paying no attention to the vultures sitting in the tree around him, unfazed by the arrows that protrude from his legs and torso. The artist who grew up in Texas uses the cowboy as a metaphor to confront the myths and legacy of the American West, masculinity, and American imperialism. The artist states, my work has had a tendency to be a bit autobiographical, not literally, but under the surface. My reality, or state of the mind at the time that the collages are made, is reflected in the psychology of the work and the stories it tells. Kenny Rivero transforms memories from his childhood into paintings and mixed media assemblages, deconstructing the familial expectations and gender roles of his Dominican American heritage that he was conditioned to accept as absolute. As a child, Rivero would peel away layers of paint and wallpaper on his bedroom wall to expose the apartment's past lives. His practice remains about the archeological unearthing and digging up of his personal experiences and history, particularly his engagement with the Afro-diasporic religious practices, Santeria and Vodun, and with music, salsa, hip hop, jazz, and merengue. Rivera collected the objects in Lady Lookin an electric doorbell, a window curtain, and hair clippers from different apartments where he lived, explaining. By using these objects, I hope to manifest some of the accumulated energies that may have been present in these spaces. The title, Lady Lookin', the artist notes, points to a possible presence of a spirit. So I'm gonna speak uh, for a moment about uh, Eduardo Sarabia, who is an American artist of Mexican descent his parents were actually Mexican, crossed the border, and he was born in America and uh, went to art school in Los Angeles. Uh, and then after he 
graduated from art school, he migrated back to his native, his parents' native country of Mexico, and he's now based out of Guadalajara. He makes, uh, and what's interesting about Eduardo, he makes works, once again, uh, another artist in the socio-political realm, poking and prodding uh, uh, about the situation at large in any given moment, in any given, the two given countries, and the border tension, especially in Mexico and America, especially the southwestern border. So he, it, uh, the materials he works with a lot are also um, native local artisans would use, glass, ceramica, textile to make his works. So this is a textile piece here, The Vengeance of Moctezuma. And this is speaking about the, the, uh, the border problems and the drug problems with the cartels. So this piece represents to, as a semaphore for the cartels, they would hang these signs off roadways so that the people muling for the drugs would know they're on the right path. But also on the, on the, the macabre side of this, the cartels would also uh, murder people and then they would write this on the sheets. So when the police, the federales found them, they, there's this macabre action to it. In Maria Fragoso's De Nuestro Jardín de Frutas Falsas, from Our Garden of False Fruit, Parallel images of two nearly identical women clutch matching babies, their mirrored poses framed by hovering red angels. The artist explores relationships through depictions of partnerships and pairings and alludes to the pattern play and doubling scene in Mexican art. The infants recall religious icons of the baby Jesus, their shining skin and the positions of their hands indicating they might in fact be figurines and not real babies at all. Fragoso says, as a queer woman, thinking about motherhood brings a lot of questions about what it could mean for me. That is why I wanted to use babies that weren't real. The figures allow for multiple readings, which the artist encourages. Fragoso says, people can put their own interpretation on it. Are they a couple? Are they a family? It's confusing, but something I'm very interested in. There is a game of revealing and concealing. So we have here Lunar Blanco by Zelia Sanchez. Uh, Zelia was born in Cuba uh, and her first uh, entry into the art world and art making was creating sets for theater there um, in um, progressive theater groups. This is before the Cuban Revolution. Uh, Zelia is now 94 years old. She moved um, to New York in the 70s. This piece actually predates that. It's from 64. Many of the minimalist artists at the time uh, were male artists and they were creating these very masculine forms. This is a much more uh, sensual feminine form. And she often includes representations of perhaps a nipple or a vulva to really give it that uh, feminine quality. And as you can see, the sculpture is uh, there are two sides to it, and that is also very important in her body of work. She also creates a wooden armature, um, which is the foundation, and then stretches the canvas over that. So again, there is a um, almost very rigid masculine form underneath, and you see the smoothness and sensuality of what uh, the work becomes. Building from his personal experiences of growing up gay in a Catholic Cuban immigrant household in Georgia, Anthony Goycalea's works explore themes of history and identity, tradition and heritage, alienation and displacement. In this drawing, The Kiss, two adolescent boys awkwardly kiss. One closes his eyes, his tongue out, while the other keeps his eyes open, gazing out softly. The embracing androgynous figures look very similar to each other. Their wisps of light brown hair, eyebrows, fair complexions, and collared shirts become almost a mirror image of the other, and possibly a composite self-portrait of the artist. Goikalea's practice often focuses on transformations, particularly highlighting the anxiety and clumsiness of adolescent desire. Translating roughly to copper helmet, Casco Cobre exudes apprehension and uncertainty. Delicately hand-crocheted copper wire stretches across the empty-faced chasm 
of a glazed clay helmet, obscuring what's inside. Garcia manipulates materials in defiance of their common uses. Chains made from clay, doilies fashioned from wire, and lace made from leather, challenging the traditional tropes of masculinity and femininity, and juxtaposing authenticity and artifice. Garcia does not shy away from the pain and conflict he experiences as a queer person of color, but explores them through artistic media. I submit to materials, he says, but also try to dominate them. I am in their service, constantly obeying their behavior, but I'm also forcing them to misbehave and to work for me. There is much pain and pleasure in the work I do. At times, I feel like I can't have one without the other. This area of the exhibition focuses more on joy, self-care, celebration, and moves away from protest and unrest into joy as a form of resistance. This is a work called Los Amigos Crack by Beatrice Montevaro. And Beatrice grew up uh, in Miami and currently lives and works there. Uh, she also is a musician as well, and she is heavily inspired by comics in her work. And so her original inspiration for this series is a DC comic book series called Super Friends. Uh, in Spanish, it translates into uh, Los Super Amigos. And so you see the title is playing off of that uh, Los Amigos crack. Now she adds a very uh, deeply personal uh, influence to that, and that is her family's uh, addiction to, to crack. And, um, and so she is, hum she is adding a lot of humor to, a, of course, a very uh, serious uh, condition in her family and also a serious problem in the country. Um, but the works are, as you can see, rather humorous. One of them says, we're going on a crack mission, obviously. And, um, as you, and the colors are, are so vibrant and it looks so fun. Uh, yet again, there is a, um, a majorly uh, serious undertone. This is Monica Kim Garza's Reggaeton Dale. In Reggaeton Dale, Monica Kim Garza depicts curvaceous women, naked, carefree, and dancing, representations of herself in moments of happiness. Large and bold, Garza's paintings visibly celebrate brown bodies, and as critic Mala Munoz writes, in a capitalist society built on the backs of unpaid and underpaid women and girls of color, Garza's paintings of brown-skinned women at rest serve as powerful and poignant counter-narratives to the abuse that women of color have historically endured in the midst of colonization, global systemic racism, and patriarchy. The title of the work references one of Garza's favorite types of music to listen to in the studio, reggaeton, a genre born in Puerto Rico in the 1990s. In Spanish, dale means to go ahead, a way of giving permission to do something. Through her paintings, Garza gives permission to herself and others to do what they love and to enjoy it. In Eddie Martinez's Untitled, a large brown helmeted body fills the blank white paper but remains bound by its borders. Glassy red saucer eyes are fixed on a shiny strawberry held up in a gesture of triumph. The figure wears green boat shoes, an accessory the artist was wearing that summer when he made the work. Recalling Untitled with Amusement, Martinez notes that the work was included in a show called Destroy All Monsters, I Believe, and was a nod to Mike Kelly, referring to the legendary musician and performance artist and his 70s Detroit punk band, Destroy All Monsters. Martinez also cites graffiti, Egyptian figures, Star Wars helmets, and Japanese soldiers as inspirations. He says, it's completely instinctual. I don't know color theory, and I'm not concerned if I'm doing it right or wrong. It's just the way I do it. This is a work by Luis Flores, and it's a self-portrait called um, Morning Coffee. And 
As you can tell, this is not a normal self-portrait. If you um, zoom in close, you can actually see that he has been rendered completely in crochet. So this is not a traditional high art material, right? This is, um, this is a, a craft often derided as a women's craft, something that, um, that is done for fun, not as a form of expression or art making. And yet, Luis Flores has turned that on his head. On its head, um, he's he's created his own likeness in crochet, um, a, a, a way of working that his mother taught him how to do. And um, so, you know, there's something really lighthearted about it. Something really approachable. Something that um, that is that is that is really fun. He does a lot of other works of himself, uh, these soft sculptures um, in WWF wrestling positions or jumping off of. Um, uh, ladder. So he's he's really playful in how it is that he is he's making his work. But beside that, there's also a much um, a much more interesting aspect to it as well. He he's thinking about these materials and the softness of the materials, and thinking about male vulnerability, sort of this inability for men to be able to be vulnerable with each other, to be soft, to um, to share intimacy, to to be friends in a way that um, that you, that you will not be questioned um, for you know your motives for why you're being. Um, so honest or open in the way you are. So, so for a lot of what Luis is, is and Luis Flores is thinking about is, is how to have these conversations, how to be honest and vulnerable. Juxtaposing the aesthetics of polished commercial graphics and text with weathered billboards and posters, Alfonso Gonzalez Jr.'s paintings visually narrate his nostalgia for and experience of growing up in East Los Angeles in the San Gabriel Valley. Faded Wave is a diptych of two barbershop posters on graffiti-tagged walls, advertising the barbers that cut, in quotes, your hair using math equations and the will of God, and looks that are the freshest in LA. Gonzalez was a graffiti writer growing up and learned commercial sign painting from his father. Despite his antipathy toward commercial images, the artist worked on a team of creating massive hand-painted billboards for several years before turning to his own art. The artist incorporates hard-edged graphic design and trompe l'oeil realism to capture nostalgia. He says, when it comes to the side of a barber shop or something inside a liquor store or something that a lot of us have seen, it's basically showing that there's art everywhere if you look at it from this perspective. So this is Patrick Martinez, um, and Patrick is an emerging and mid-career artist uh, that grew, he grew up in Los Angeles and currently lives and works there. He is of a Filipino, Mexican, and Native American descent. Uh, so he really represents like uh, this merge of cultures in LA um, and has seen a lot of gentrification, and that is the center subject of this work called We're Moving. He often salvages materials um, and and incorporates them in, in his work, as you can see. You have um, you know, the signage and then this rose neon that is bursting through to represent hope. Now in Black Owned, he focuses on the idea of uh, a sign that you would see outside of a Black Owned store. You know, often his neons, um, there is one meaning on the forefront of that piece and then there is a much deeper, timely meaning. The title of Gabriela Sanchez's painting, A Rose is a Rose, evokes Gertrude Stein's iconic phrase, a rose is a rose is a rose, which many interpret to mean, it is what it is. Using dotted lines and arrows, Gothic script and handwriting, a pink background and red lettering, a disembodied green head and a floating eye, the painting itself suggests the opposite. Nothing is as it seems. Sanchez, who has built her artistic practice on breaking down and disassembling the hegemonic meanings of words and phrases, explains. The fact that everything is political is more easily pointed out when you are a woman, a person of color, or someone from any margin. When, say, Ed Ruscha uses Gothic script, it has a different representational weight compared to when I use that same script. And she continues, in part, that's what my paintings are about. So Candida Alvarez, this is a painting that was in 
her solo show at our gallery in Palm Beach last year, and we're getting ready. She's working on a body of work for a solo show in Los Angeles next year. Uh, but she's an amazing abstract painter and really a colorist. I mean, her, her interest in color is, I think, phenomenal and, and not easy to pull off putting, you know, that kind of red next to blue and, and just her connection, of her, the way she puts color together, it is really, I think, special and, and unique. And I saw the work and I really liked it. And uh, I went to Chicago and saw her studio and the rest was history. We started working together and we've placed the work among, you know, in addition to Beth DeWoody and in incredible collections. And um, this was actually a painting that was inspired as a personal story, a little side personal story, but from a photograph that uh, she took, that a friend of mine took on my wedding day. And um, that's sort of me in the middle in the very similar colored <laughs> dress. Um, and then just all the colors of Palm Beach. And um, she made it uh, after my wedding and I was gonna buy it and then Beth saw it. And of course I had to give it to Beth. So um, I'm really happy it's in her collection though. This portion of the exhibition is about visibility presence and joy as a form of resistance. To be seen and heard is to heal and transcend oppression. So this is a work by Lillian Martinez. It's called Yellow Dog. And um, Lillian Martinez is really thinking a lot about the history of art. So here at the feet of this woman is a yellow dog. Dogs at the feet of, of people um, and portraits in art history, usually white men, um, were signs of loyalty, were signs of wealth, were signs of stability and power. And here uh, Martinez has um, appropriated this sort of trope in our history, this dog, and placed it at the feet of, of a large brown woman. And that is really intentional. For the, for the artist, it's, it's about representation. It's about taking up space in spaces where um, black, brown, and indigenous people have not formally been included. And that includes art museums. So um, by looking back at our history and appropriating that and sort of changing it, turning it on its head, she has um, inserted herself within a history of art and, um, and really made a place for her figures um, within, within this painting and within the art world. Franco Mondini Ruiz unabashedly plays the capitalist art market like a game, selling ready-mades and knickknacks as high art. And much like Marcel Duchamp and subsequent pop artists of the 20th century, Mondini Ruiz still poses the question, what constitutes fine art? The artist further satirizes high-dollar pop art by producing pinatas depicting Andy Warhol's Campbell soup cans and Jeff Koons' balloon dogs, reproductions of reproductions. The lawyer-turned-artist is just as outspoken about his personal life as a gay man of color, is forthright about his HIV-positive status, and is a staunch advocate for social justice. Whatever Happened to Abraham Lincoln playfully weighs in on the widespread debate over the 16th president's sexuality. Portraying the president in drag, the artist cheekily suggests Lincoln was indeed homosexual and simultaneously highlights the varied and widespread omissions about LGBTQ plus people in the commonly taught history of the United States. Like many painters before him, Esteban Ocampo Geraldo explores self-portraits, creating vibrant studies of his own face. He calls these works selfies, capturing not only a moment in his own personal history, but also connecting the tradition of self-portraiture to a contemporary commonplace practice. Each of his selfie paintings is distinct, with wildly shifting color palettes, styles, and expressions, as if he has spent hours posing and editing with social media filters. Selfie with Big Smile exaggerates the mouth by scaling it up to larger than natural proportions, painted in full color against a dull wash for the other features, clothes, and background. Waist deep and topless in a pool of water, William Villalongo's Nymph No. 6 looks out at the viewer through holes in the abstract painting she wears as a mask. The artist combines two tropes from art history that are often considered unrelated. 
18th century nymph paintings, and modernist abstraction. In order to make visible the continuation of the colonial gaze of desire and plunder into the history of modern art. In Via Longo's revised version, this nymph stares back, claiming space. The painting, mask, boasts shields her identity and references Pablo Picasso's Les Demoiselles de Avignon, 1907, a painting that clearly links the visual appropriation of the aesthetics of African masks plundered during European colonization of Africa into the canon of modern art. Throughout art history, that outward look was squarely focused on the plunder from distant lands, Fialongo explains. Carlos Rolón's study for We the People Afrocomb is a gold-leafed Afro hair pick crowned with a black power fist. In the 1970s, hair picks were worn in Afros as a political emblem and signature of collective identity. In place of the distinctive tab on top of the pick, Rolón has created a black power fist another declarative statement of visibility and presence. By rendering the comb in gold leaf, a material often used to convey value, divinity, and power, the artist has transformed an easy to acquire, mass produced object into an object of veneration, a beatific talisman of hope for the revolution. Clotilde Jimenez's Olympia is a radical departure from Edouard Manet's 19th century painting of the same title and a reclamation of the black body in space, particularly the queer black male body. Reclining on a white bed, the artist has drawn, painted, and collaged a naked figure with locks. His single-eyed gaze that looks out at the viewer and his bulging pectoral muscles are cut from a publication. The artist physically cuts materials in order to piece them back together as a way to reconstruct memory and build new histories. The artist says, I want to be a storyteller for people who look like me, the people whose stories have been marginalized and ignored. What I want to do is be the person that I needed when growing up, someone who depicts the complexities of black life, what it means and how it is okay. I aim to provide a greater representation of my people within the art historical canon. What a lot of people don't know about Jose's work is that he comes from a performance background, actually, and he was doing performances all over the world where he was channeling a you know, thousand year old um, spirit called Carlos and claiming that he was a spiritual medium this was the performance, but people didn't know it was a performance art piece. They would come from all over, thousands of people, to see him channel this spirit. And it was all based in sort of shamanistic rituals. So he would have objects on the stage with him and he would do this performance. And after doing these performances and, and having them videotaped and some of that work appeared, and that was the work that appeared in the Whitney Biennial, he really wanted to go back to making art, making objects rather. And so he started making these crystal paintings and taking that material and putting it onto a painted, like creating paintings, sculptural paintings. And, but they were also based, he's very interested in the writings of Carlos Castanedas and also Carl Sagan, who has written about his work. And so this idea of inner and outer space, you know, this idea of the cosmos and then our inner kind of cosmos and where are things in between. And, you know, on one hand, he was very much about exposing sort of these charlatans who take people's money and claim to be spirit, you know, channelers or mediums or I can read your mind. But then on the other, in this other way, looking at the transformative power of art. So maybe it's not a medium or a channeler or someone who's reading your mind or a crystal, but maybe it's all of that combined and those ideas in an object, in an art that can transform you. And also back to the, the Promised Land work, it was the first piece he made after he was in the ICE detention center and he had a real moment where he thought, am I gonna go really dark? I mean, that was a very dark, dark moment in his life and very difficult. And he made a conscious decision to in fact make work that was even more beautiful and more joyful and more spiritual and more celebratory. And so The Promised Land was the first work he made after he was in detention. It's all made out of um, feathers and 
quills, porcupine quills, watercolor, there's crystals and it's all hand cut out and there's paint. And uh, the title of the piece is The Promised Land, which I think is very uh, a thread that runs through this exhibition because a lot of these artists, some are born in America and a lot tell the immigrant story of coming from Latin America. And Jose's has that same story of coming from Venezuela as a young artist and wanting to go to school in New York, you know, so many artist dreams and was obsessed with Warhol and the factory and uh, went to New York and went to SVA and um, but fled a very brutal situation in Venezuela. This is the 2019 artwork by Leonardo Benzant titled Black Joy Takes Courage. Benzant says, I imagine myself as an urban shaman exploring both my familiar visible world and the hidden dimensions of other realms that lurk beneath the surface of daily life. Inspired by his Afro-Caribbean roots and the African Atlantic diaspora, the joyously colorful Black Joy Takes Courage is made up of beads and leather, fabric and string, and suggests the multiple and varied inherited experiences that people of African descent have adopted as methods for survival. The concept of black joy, explained by Cleaver Cruz, founder of the Black Joy Project, is, and I quote, an act of resistance when we acknowledge that we exist in an anti-black world that is set up to ensure we do not survive. To choose life and to enjoy aspects of that life is a radical act. Interdisciplinary artist and poet Cecilia Vicuña investigates the interconnectedness of the human experience across time. Influenced by the ancient and mysterious Incan communication device, Kipu, which used a complex system of knots to record information, Vicuña uses the full range of fiber to create visual meditations on the liminal spaces between life and death, the past and present, the natural and the man-made. Her use of unspun wool presents a natural resource in its raw potential. The dye is the beginning of the manufacturing process. The pink hue and full texture of the rolled fiber is flesh-like. The artist says, an object is not an object. It is the witness to a relationship. In complementary union, two opposites collide to create new forms. Seeing and naming creates the space for the beauty of the exchange to unfold. Moving from Lima, Peru to Miami and living in Houston, Chicago, and New York, William Cordova speaks through personal experience to address themes of displacement, transition, and adaptation. He draws from his Afro-Peruvian roots, as well as the graffiti and hip-hop culture that he embraced when he first arrived in the U.S. Those references, a Peruvian reed boat, stereo, and car, tagged by the legendary graffiti writer Dondi, collide in memories of underdevelopment. The title references Tomas Gutierrez Alea's 1968 film of the same name, a 16 millimeter Bolex camera symbolizing Landrian is among the collection of objects suspended in a field of gold leaf, alluding to the literal alchemy of turning a base metal into gold and the modern cultural alchemists whose contributions have gone underappreciated or underrecognized, who transform their experiences into treasure. This is a work by Fairly Bias, and it's called For Marie-Louise Godavid, Exiled, Keeper of Order, Anna Kanoa. And this is a dual portrait of two women um, from Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean history who have gone unrecognized previously. Uh, Maria Louise Goy David was a Haitian, a black Haitian queen who um, was exiled after her husband died. And Anna Kanoa was a Taina chieftain who um, was trying to save her people while the Spanish were coming and worked to try to negotiate for them, worked to try to work to, to find a peaceful solution. Um, both women who are under-recognized in, in history. This is um, a work that's an honor and an homage to them. 
The, you can see that her eyes are looking straight at you. They really bring you in. The headdress that she's wearing is, um, is reminiscent of the headdresses that black women were made to wear in, um, in I think it was 19th century New Orleans. So uh, there's a, so many different parts. And she's thinking about the diaspora much more broadly um, and sort of the connections that these women, that, uh, these women leaders have made across time and space. This is Angel Otero, and he grew up in Puerto Rico. And first, when he first was making art and making paintings, he was really depicting his homeland and his family, lots of vibrant color, uh, and they were very representational. And as his process progressed, he loved the idea of deconstructing the painting process and, um, and creating, you know, really blurring the lines between painting and sculpture. And so we come to Winners, which is a work uh, that was created. The under part of this work is actual trophies that he has salvaged. Um, and on top of that, we have oil skins. Now this is a very unique process that this artist has developed and he creates the oil skins by applying the paint or even making an entire painting that is representational on a piece of glass or plexiglass and then he scrapes them off in layers and then applies them either to uh, a surface as you see here, um, an object or actually drapes them to become a painting itself. And you can see all the color that is within the gold, and that color comes from older paintings. You know, the idea of the trophy, we usually see these trophies as being very shiny. It is just a very different surface, and so he is subverting the usual meaning of the trophy. This is work by Gisela Colon. This is one of her monoliths. She usually, she does work that are blow molded acrylic like this, with these layers and a nucleus that are wall mounted sculptures. Uh, and the monoliths that she makes now are actually uh, carbon fiber that were a collaboration with an aerospace technology company. So they're enormous, they're way bigger than this. They're 15 feet, 20 feet, and they go outdoors. And there was one recently in Desert X in Saudi Arabia that looked incredible. And she's really this next generation of light and space and minimalism. And, uh, but her work is also feminist and feminine and obviously this is a very phallic you know shape and image so the idea of a woman artist making something that's phallic is a very sort of you think of Kusama or uh, Louise Bourgeois and Linda Bengalis those women are certainly an influence as well uh, but you know what's also um, interesting is how the way they capture the light and play with the light and you would look at this and maybe think, okay, this doesn't necessarily, like a lot of the other work in the show, register as this is a Latinx artist. You know, there's not the overt representational identity going on here, but she does talk a lot about the influence. She grew up in Puerto Rico and the landscape and the flora and fauna and the uh, biodynamic, you know, the water that glows. And so, it is very much to her, that history and her growing up there and the light and the sky and the environment is just as influential to her as the history of minimalism or light and space. So that's kind of where you see that influence of her Latin American heritage coming out in this work. Raul de Nieves' figures transcend their accumulated media to form a presence, elevating discarded materials into a magical force. In Greek mythology, a psychopomp is a spiritual guide that leads souls into the afterlife or through a journey of transition. The psychopomp has been adopted in various forms by a wide array of cultures, including in the artist's native Mexico, where it is referred to as Xolotl. De Nieves likens his sculptures to deities from his own subconscious reflecting my works are like this uber fantasy of the inner self and a celebration of what we can be. De Nieves is also heavily influenced by Mexican artisans. He says, I saw how these artists worked with beads or clay or straw, giving them a new form of shine and turning them into something completely different and beautiful. Now based in New York City, De Nieves creates alternate realms by taking something simple and mundane and turning it into something magical.
Thank you for joining us for this virtual tour of a very anxious feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience, 20 years of the Beth Rudin DeWoody Collection. A special thank you as well to our presenting sponsors, Dorothea L. Leonhardt Foundation, Inc., the Dorothea Leonhardt Fund at the Communities Foundation of Texas, Inc., and Joanne Leonhardt Casulo. Additional sponsorship support is provided by the Roanoke Arts Commission of the City of Roanoke and Blue Ridge Beverage. We could have not presented this exhibition without you. While I wish we could all gather in the galleries to experience this incredible exhibition together, I'm grateful that we're able to share this experience online. Thank you for the support of the Taubman Museum of Art, wishing you health, happiness, inspiration, and creativity now and always. Here's to seeing you in the galleries at the Taubman Museum of Art again soon.